Hi, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Um, I am here with someone who needs uh, very little introduction. I'm Miriam Elder, the world editor at BuzzFeed News. Uh, this is Malala Yousafzai, who you probably are all uh, very well aware of, a Pakistani activist, uh, activist for women's education, the youngest ever recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, we're very, very excited to have uh, her here at the World Economic Forum, at the Open Forum. Welcome. So I'm so excited to talk to you because it's such an interesting moment in time. It's when we're seeing governments and groups around the world growing ever more repressive, talking about building walls. At the same time, we have women around the world rising up, calling for equality, speaking out against sexual harassment. And I can think of no one better to speak about this than you. So I'd love to hear first about your journey to feminism. You once said that feminist for you was a tricky word. You've ne you now embrace it. So what changed for you, and what does that word mean for you now? Uh, well, thank you so much for coming here, and it's an honor to speak to you today. Uh, when I first heard about feminism, it was not about women's rights, it was not about equality, but it was just these messages that I was seeing that feminism is controversial and that feminism is women's superiority and these things, you know, these views exist and, uh, and, and I just wasn't sure what this word means and then uh, I just looked more into it and I realized that feminism is just another word for equality. It means equality and no one would object equality, no one should object equality and it just means that women uh, should have equal rights as men. And then I said, well, it's very simple. It's not as complicated as some people have made it. Uh, and then I embraced feminism, and, uh, and I was already a feminist, speaking out for girls' education, speaking out for women in Pakistan, and then all around the world. When you speak about women's rights, you become feminist, even if you embrace it or not. Uh, so, and right now, looking at the world and how women are standing up and raising their voice, whether it's Time's Up or Me Too, or uh, the, this, this movement is building up by women, and, and they are realizing that their voice is so important to the change that they want to see. And I said it long ago at the UN speech that first we wanted men to do something for us, but like that time is gone now. We're not going to ask men to change the world. We are going to do it ourselves. We are going to stand up for ourselves. We are going to raise our voices, and we are going to change the world. Uh, so I really encourage women and girls to speak out against any discrimination, any, any violence that they see in their community, in their society. And so you spend a lot of your time um, when you're not studying. <laughs> you spend a lot of your time thinking about uh, activism for uh, girls' education. How has the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement changed your thoughts about how you need to approach education for girls in particular? Education is, is really important, and uh, it's, it's, it's about how we teach our children uh, about the world, about equality, about human rights. And I think it's so important that our education gives the message of equality to every child. And, and this, this is where like a child's mind builds up. And, and right from the beginning, if we teach equality uh, at school level, I think they would develop the sense that they have equal rights as girls in their school have, and, and girls have equal rights as boys in their school. So I think uh, education can play a key role in giving the message of equality. And um, uh, yes, yeah. And so you've told us your message to uh, the people who support Me Too and Time's Up, which is speak up when you can. Uh, we also have a lot of government leaders here at Davos right now. Trump is flying in, of course, tomorrow. What would your message be to someone like Trump, who has his own history with, uh, with or lack of history with women's rights? Um, <laughs> what, would you, what kind of message would you want him to hear from you here? I I am just I just get so disappointed to see that people are at these high positions and they are openly uh, they talk against women they do not accept women as equal they harass women and and it's just shocking for a second to believe that this is actually happening and and I hope that women stand up and they speak out against it. And I hope that people who are involved in, in such 
shameful things. They think about their own daughters, their own mothers, and, and their own close female relatives. And, and just imagine for a second that uh, can, they, can they let it happen to their daughters, to their sisters, to their mothers? And I, and I don't think they would accept that. So I think uh, they, they, need to, they, they need to look at it from that perspective as well. But also, if they, because like I can't change a person, I'll try all my best to give advice. But uh, I think it's, it's a time uh, for women to raise up their voice so their voices are heard and their voices reaches uh, those ears. And if their voices reaches those minds that uh, still have uh, uh, those, those views that we are trying to fight against and for a second we thought that they didn't exist but they still exist. And this is a time where increasingly around the, around the world, it seems like people feel more and more disconnected from their governments, that governments don't necessarily exist to take care of the people. Um, what, how has that influenced your own life? Is that something that you have felt? And what do you feel the role of government should be um, in the kind of issues that we're talking about? So in terms of governments, um, what my focus has been is uh, encouraging governments and, and trying to get them to invest in girls' education because that's one way towards women empowerment. There are 130 million girls right now who cannot go to school. And if you talk about women's empowerment, their equality, if you talk about women participating in the economy, women becoming part of the labor force, women contributing to, uh, to, to the whole development of a country, we have to invest in their education. So in terms of my work uh, on education, I do try to uh, do advocacy, uh, try to reach to governments, try to, like now I'm here at World Economic Forum, my message is always to encourage these governments as well as business uh, groups to uh, bring education, especially girls' education, to their top priorities and invest in girls. Uh, it is it is ben it's going to benefit the girls and the communities where they are living, but also contribute to the whole uh, economy. And, and we the, the benefits are uh, are unlimited, and, and we have to uh, remind them this. I'd love to switch a little bit now and ask you a bit about you know your life as a person. Um, you do so much. You're a full time student at Oxford. You're here now. You're doing all this activism. Like, what does an average day in your life look like? <laughs> Uh, at Oxford, it's quite hard because you have to do like two or three essays a week, and uh, it's it's challenging because uh, I'm doing PP, which is three different subjects: philosophy, politics, and economics. And every teacher would give you their work. So one would say, "Do the philosophy work, do the economics work," and you have to manage your time yourself. I think that's what university life is all about. Uh, your time is with you. In, Here's the work that you have to do. Here are the assignments. Here's the extra activities that you want to get involved in. So it's just managing your time. Uh, and I missed two days of my university. And uh, I'm just panicking a bit. How am I going to finish all the essays? But uh, I hope that giving up these two days would help me to deliver the message of education for all those 130 million girls who are out of school. Uh, and, and we have to keep on fighting for this. If we remain silent, like just imagine for a second, like every day, how many girls do we lose? There is, there is potential that we are losing. Uh, and, and, I, and I realize this more because I go and I visit refugee camps. I was recently in Lebanon, and I met Syrian refugee girls in a room, and I asked, I was asking one of, uh, all of those girls what their dream was, what did they want to become in their future, and one girl said she wants to become an architect, and I asked why. And she said she wants to become an architect uh, because when she was leaving her country, she saw that her country was destroyed and devastated. And on that day, she decided that one day she will come back and she will rebuild her country. So war has actually affected these children. There is early child marriages. There is child trafficking. There is, there is those norms and taboos that are stopping girls in their, in their fight to achieve their dreams. So. So I think about these girls every day, and then I say, OK, you have to do your own study, but also speak out for those girls, because I cannot imagine losing those girls. They are a resource uh, to, for their community, for all of us. Just imagine, like, in this room, how many girls do we see here? Imagine for a second that you are living in a society where if you did not get education, you would be just limited to your house. All your job was cooking, cleaning, taking care of children, 
And that's it. You'd never be able to have a voice to speak out for yourself, to have rights. And so, and I think that's something that many girls are facing right now. And, and we have to protect them uh, as individuals, but also uh, think about its benefits to each and every one of us. So you have devoted your life to, to living these experiences, and it's a noble cause, and, but one that I can imagine takes quite a deep psychological and emotional toll. So what do you do to keep yourself strong? And when you have one of these days where you just feel like you can't take this all on anymore, what do you tell yourself to, to keep going? Well, I know for sure that it is not one person's job to... Uh, to do this, and I know that I'm, I'm like I can't send all girls to school. It's it would be nearly impossible. But what I can do is I can send as many as possible. I can speak about for as many as possible. And what is under my potential, I will do that. I will do my job. But what I also try to do is to reach out to as many people as I can, whether they are from the business sector, from the uh, government, from the NGO sector, to encourage them to invest in girls' education. And, and I think it's just reminding everyone that they can also have a role in this, whether it's media, whether it's business or governments, that they all can, can play a role in this. And it's, it's, it's a responsibility that we all uh, should realize that we, we, we can all participate in this and we can all contribute to this. So uh, it, is, it can be uh, stressful sometimes and because you want to change the world in a day and you realize you can't. Uh, but, uh, but as you keep on going and like five years when I started Malala Fun, I just did not know what to do. And I said, I want all girls to go to school and but how to get them in school. And now, like, uh, looking back five years, we have done projects in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Lebanon, in Jordan. Uh, we are expanding to Mexico. We have done work in India. We have done film campaigning. We are empowering local leaders and local advocates, which we call the Gulmakai Network. Uh, we named it Gulmakai because this was the pen name that I was using for my BBC blog. And we are uh, introducing girl advocate programs. So things are happening. And more and more girls are speaking out for themselves. And we are encouraging local advocates to bring change in their community. So I do see change, and I am hopeful, I am positive. So uh, I asked Twitter um, what questions I should ask you, and there was one that came back over and over and over again. And people are really curious to know like, where you draw your inspiration from, and particularly which books you are, are into. Um, I, I really like reading stories of women and girls, and. Uh, one book that is always my favorite was The Alchemist, and it was just uh, staying true to your, your goals and, and try to, uh, to keep on moving, even though you may face many difficulties in your way, but you have to keep on moving. And that is something that I'm doing. I just keep on moving. Uh, but also, I read a story about Mina, which was an Afghan hero, and it was uh, an inspirational book of how this woman uh, struggled for women's rights and equality. And uh, uh, Parwana's journey and the breadwinner. Uh, so I, I really like reading about uh, girl stories who have overcome challenges in their lives and uh, who have fought for their rights. You are such a public figure. Is there anything that you that you miss from not having the privacy that you once had? I think, yeah, if you go out and, like, if you are, I don't know, like, you have to be just careful because if people recognize you, then uh, they know, like, it's, it's you. So uh, <laughs> so it's, you have to be careful. Uh, but I do have, like, I do have friends and I have two younger brothers, so I try to stay normal. Like, I am a normal, I, I am a girl and I'm a student and I am 20 years old and I want to have my social life at university, I want to have my social life with my friends, I want to have my social life with my brothers, which is fighting. Uh, and <laughs> so I do go to like maybe cinema or go and play mini golf. So uh, I try, try my best. Yeah. This is probably the worst question for a college student, but um, what, what are you thinking for the future? Will you stay in the UK? I know, I'm sorry. But are you thinking to stay in the UK or? 
Uh, to be honest, uh, for university, yes, for sure I'm staying, but um, hopefully if the work is not too bad and I can manage it, yes, of course I'm staying for that. But after university, uh, I just don't know. Probably yes, but um, I hope that I can go back to Pakistan uh, sometime and see my country because it is just so hard if you haven't seen your home, your, your relatives, your friends for more than five years. And uh, it wasn't that I left that country by choice. It was the circumstances that forced me to leave. So uh, I want to go back to Pakistan. And uh, I don't know. My father wants me to study further. And like, I don't know, do master's and PhD. And he wants me to like uh, stick to university. And but I'm saying, no, I want to maybe do some more work and explore more after I finish my PPE degree at Oxford. And what for you has been the most the most challenging thing, the most difficult thing in communicating your message, would you say? So I have, uh, I, I deliver my message at different platforms. I go and I speak at refugee camps to parents and girls. I go and I speak at schools in Lebanon and Jordan. I go and I speak at uh, business communities. I speak at global forums. There's World Economic Forum. I go and I meet prime ministers and presidents. So I'm speaking at different events, and the challenges vary depending on where you are. And I think one of the biggest challenges is just getting enough funding for education. There's lack of funding. There's lack of investment in education. Funding towards education is declining. Every country is cutting their aid towards uh, girls' education, and, and we have to keep pushing for this. Uh, and I go to a refugee camp and I try to inspire young girls and, and, and their parents, and often, most of the time, it works. Parents say, yes, we want our children to go to school, but there is not a school nearby or uh, there are not enough teachers. And then uh, you say, oh, you also have to then advocate that there is enough funding, so, these, so there are schools available, there are enough teachers available. And, uh, and I hope that our leaders realize that uh, they have to invest in education. They have to provide enough funding towards education so that we don't lose this future generation, uh, this, this potential that we have. Uh, the number is in millions, so we have to keep on reminding them. And I think that's one of the challenges. Uh, I think it should be easier for like prime ministers and presidents because I haven't met a single prime minister who would not send their own children to school. All of them send their children to school. Their children go to university. They do not need any explanation for how important education is. But when it comes to the rest of the world's children, then they struggle a bit of how education is important. So that's something that you have to keep on reminding them. And so we have a lot of students uh, in the room. What would, what would your advice be to them? How can they help your cause? Um, so I started speaking out when I was 11 years old. And I had no idea if my voice can have an impact or not. But soon I realized that people were listening to me, and my voice was reaching to people around the world. So change is possible. And do not limit yourself. Do not stop yourself just because you are young. And uh, often we think that you have to become prime minister or president or a CEO to be the change maker. No, you don't. You can bring change at any point, at any age you want. Uh, it is any action that you take is useful. It, that action can have an impact, whether it's blogging, whether it's fundraising, whether it's raising awareness through social media, whether it's doing uh, work in your local community, whether it's doing advocacy, uh, whether it's doing petitions. All these things matter. So you, once we all start doing this, we create a global movement. So I really encourage you to get involved in this movement for girls' right to education, for women's rights, for women's equality, in this movement for a better life for each and every one of us. So you mentioned that when you started the Malala Fund, you were thinking in one way, and now it's, it, well, it's, it's grown, and you know, five years have passed. And what, um, do you have any regrets? Is there anything that you would have done differently? Regrets? I, th I don't have regrets, because um, this is like what I wanted to do, and I, and, I, uh, and I just stay focused on my plan, which was to empower young girls uh, to 
make sure that as many girls can get quality education as possible. And I, my, my dream was also to empower local advocates, just as my father and I were campaigning in Swat Valley. My vision is to inspire other local uh, activists in their regions. So that dream is coming true as well uh, through the Gulmakai network. So I'm very happy, but I think there's always like you can do even more. And, and when you see that there are still 130 million girls out of school, it just keeps you moving that there, you, have to, you have to keep on working until all girls can go to school. Do you ever sleep? <laughs> sleep. Uh, these days, no. <laughs> Because uh, you had to get up quite early, and uh, I got up quite early today. And uh, at university, I try to, but <laughs> you know, sometimes um, you are with your friends and you stay up till late, and then in the morning you have early lectures, and I have to like walk half an hour to the lectures. So sometimes I just can't make it. I, you just can't. Do it. It's hard to get up early in the morning. I'm not a morning person. I would happily get up at 12 or 1 p.m. Uh, sometimes I get up and I say, like, I didn't see morning today. Like, it's, it's 1 p.m. Like, morning just is not part of my life. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a good, good college experience. Um, I'd love to open it up to questions um, from you guys. I'm sure that uh, you have plenty. Um, I think that uh, we have translation somewhere. And I'll, if, if you're not speaking English, I'll just repeat the question. I see someone is very excited right there. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Malala, my name is Federico, and I'm a global shaper from El Salvador and a proud feminist. <laughs> my question for you is what um, word of advice you hear around the world giving to girls and women that you actually don't agree with or challenge? <laughs> What advice that people give to women that I don't agree with? Um, one, one thing I have heard is like, uh, I go to some places and people say that, oh, like women are told to dress in a certain way, whether it's extreme religious or whether it's like the two Western kind of views. And, uh, and I think some people think that women are uh, women, if women dress in a certain way, then that's not their choice, or where they say like, uh, it shows too much or it hides too much. And I think it's important to realize that uh, this is when we talk about feminism, we talk about women, their empowerment, and their independence. And it should not be the decision of anyone else to tell women how to dress, how to speak how to act, how to walk, how to talk. As long as it's that woman's decision, as long as it's her choice, it is OK. There is not a standard that defines, OK, women, you dress this way, you talk this way, uh, then OK, it ticks all the boxes of feminism or women's rights, and this is how you should dress. No, I think it's, we should leave it to women's decision, whatever job they want to do, how they want to dress, how they want to talk. Uh, and I think we have to keep pushing for this. Thank you. Thank um, you. My name is Alicia. I'm a mother of two young girls. We live here in Switzerland, which is quite a privileged place. Um, we love your stories. They have your books and senior movies. Thank you. Um, and I asked them if I could ask one question to Malala, what should I ask? And they said, why did you fight so hard to go to school? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a question we probably all know the answer to. But how do I explain to, uh, to young girls who are in a privileged posi excuse me, position, first of all, why is it so important to go to school? And how do we teach them the empathy when they come from such a privileged place so that they can recognize you know, that not everybody is in the same position as them. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for getting the book. It's called Malala's Magic Pencil. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and what I wanted through this book was to inspire young children that uh, they can bring change. They can use their voice, their, any skill or they have, whether it's art, whether it's painting or anything, uh, they can, that they can change the world. So girls' education um, was important to me because when I was 11 years old, 
uh, it was January 2009 when the Taliban announced on FM radio that Nogal is allowed to go to school. And that was the moment when I realized that education was more than reading books and doing homework. It was about the empowerment of women, which the extremists realized before anyone else. They knew that women get empowered through education. They were not against these books and things. They were actually against women being empowered, women standing equal to men, women doing jobs, women being independent, women making their own decision. That was their problem. And they knew that women get that when they have education. So they recognized the importance of education, which unfortunately many leaders don't and many people don't. And that is why they stopped girls from going to school. And for me, it was shocking because I wanted to become a doctor at that time. And I knew that if I don't go to school, I won't be able to become a doctor. I would stay inside the house because for women to go outside, like education is, is in a way, in, in patriarchal societies, uh, it is harder for women to go out, to, to earn for herself if she does not complete her education and can get a good job. Uh, but also, I was thinking that if I don't go to school, then it means I would get married at the age of 13 or 14. I would become a mother, become a grandmother, we'll have children, uh, and just stay inside the four walls of these houses. And I would never get the opportunity to be myself, to be an individual, to be a woman. And, and that is something that I just could not imagine for a second. So um, I think it would be important for children to read stories of girls who have struggled uh, for their education. Uh, there, and, and there are many stories out there. On Malala Fund, we share stories of girls who are fighting for their right to go to school. Uh, so education is really empowerment uh, for women. Education is, is a way for them to, to have their rights. Oh, thank you. You are a great inspiration for me in my work. Um, I'm from Colombia, and I work for an NGO called Colombianitos. We use sport as a tool for social development. We educate kids in soft and peace-building skills. We also have a um, girl empowerment program for girls who are living surrounded by poverty and also uh, violence, you know. Some of them are victims of our armed conflict. So I just would love for you to give a message for those kids, for those girls, that they can change to encourage them to study and also to believe that they can change their future. Well, thank you so much for your question. And also thank you for all the work that you are doing. Um, I think my message to girls and to boys and to everyone is always that uh, they should believe in themselves, believe in their voice, believe in their actions, uh, and, and they are the future and they are the present. So they make up the community, and each and every action they take matters. It has an impact on the society, so they must get involved. They must try uh, to help as many children as they can, and they should also focus on their own studies. So tomorrow they can also invest that, what they have got through education, they can invest that uh, in, their, in their community. Uh, and and it, just, it just grows, it just accelerates and, and multiplies. So, and, I, and, and, and I'm sure that you are doing great work and you will be inspiring them already. Thank you. Are there any students out there? Are you a student? Good morning, my name is Camilla and I'm also a student. And Obviously, Malala, you are such a role model for so many people and women, including myself. And I was just wondering, do you have a role model? <laughs> well, thank you so much for your question, Camilla. Um, my role model has always been my father. And when we talk about feminism in men, I think he is he's the example that I can give. Firstly, because when I was born, and he, he named me after the Malala of Mewan, who was the Afghan hero. And his vision was that she was the only Pashtun woman who was, who was recognized by her own name. We don't have any other Pashtun woman hero. We don't know any, except Malala. 
So he named me after her. And just with the vision that there was a Pashtun woman who was known for her heroism, who stood up and, and raised her voice. Uh, but also, like, when his cousin, like, made a family tree and he brought it and it was all men's name, and my father wrote my name on a family tree, the first girl's name on a family tree. Uh, and so he was challenging society, he was challenging norms, he was challenging those taboos at each and every point in his life. He was not just speaking or giving, uh, writing an article, he was actually doing. He was a, a feminist who was taking action. So if he had not allowed me, I would not have been able to be here. I would not have been able to speak out. There were many girls who wanted to speak out during terrorism in Swat Valley, but their parents stopped them. Many girls wanted to do something, but their brothers did not allow them. So I'm really grateful to my father that uh, he that he allowed his daughter to be herself, and um, and also to my mother. She is a courageous, brave woman who uh, tells both me and my father to continue campaigning for women's rights and girls' education, and uh, and then all the the great people we had in our history from. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. to Nelson Mandela to Benazir Bhutto, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, uh, and many others, but also the girls who I meet in in camps, in in, in schools, in 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 the trips I make, uh, their stories always stay in my heart, and and they inspire me to continue my work for education. We're running just a little bit over since we started late, but I think we probably have time for one more question, and somewhere right there. Um, sorry, my name's Joey, um, and obviously you've embraced your own education in both the UK and Pakistan. And I was wondering, when you began your uh, secondary education in the UK, if your approach to learning changed, or if for you um, learning has always been the same and will always be the same? I think there is a big difference between education in Pakistan compared to the UK. and. Uh, uh, one was that in Pakistan, the subjects are science, maths, history, Pakistan studies, and Islamic studies, and Urdu language, while in the UK, they had subjects like drama, like physical education, like music, and like cooking. And I said, wow, like, are these even subjects? <laughs> uh, these are considered to be like the extra work, which is not, you are not supposed to do them at school. So it just opened my mind of, to what education can actually mean, that uh, if you are getting to school, it doesn't mean you have to become a doctor or engineer. Like, education is actually learning and just finding out about yourself. And if you want to be an athlete, if you want to be a musician, if you want to be an artist, it's your choice. You don't have, you shouldn't be forced to become a doctor or engineer because it's the only good thing to do. So it opened my mind in terms of that. Also, I did critical thinking as a subject and I just thought, it is amazing. Like everyone should know critical thinking because, especially in the time right now, when there's like fake news, like people should have critical thinking that they know where the information is coming from, who is giving this information. Look at the expertise of the person, any vested interest. All these things are just crucial, 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 crucial. And uh, so, and also the teaching environment. Like in schools, they have powerpoints, they have computers. TV, uh, students have access to iPads and, and other technology, and, and something that maybe is taken for granted here, but in our school we had only a whiteboard and a, and a marker and just books. We didn't have access to computer. But it, it is changing now. There's technology is going into school, but technology can actually help a lot uh, in, in education, digital learning. Uh, it can help in... Uh, uh, in e-learning, students who can't have access to school, maybe they, it can help those students as well, where they can learn online. So, um, so I have seen a big difference, and I think from that what we can learn is that how can we use these resources, this technology, in helping children who are in refugee camps, in helping children who are in the developing countries and need access to quality education. We might actually have room for one, one last one right there. Hello, my name is Anita. I'd like to ask, uh, my question goes a bit to the question before. What can you say about the importance of educating young boys to accept women's equality? It is crucial. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is so important because 
at the end of the day, when we talk about feminism and women's rights, we're actually addressing men. Uh, we're actually addressing men, and we want them to recognize that, um, that women should be accepted, that women should, be, women should not be prevented, women should not be stopped from a role just because they're women, that uh, talent should be appreciated, their skills should be appreciated. Uh, so I think men have a big role to play. Uh, and uh, again, as I mentioned about my father, if he was not there and if he had not allowed me to speak, I would not have been here. And also now I see my brothers and uh, they have, they're completely different, like their, their views are different. They accept their sister being a bit bossy. They accept their sister uh, going to school, which was something that I still hear stories where uh, I see that there is this young brother and all the older sisters and like he's dominating the family and he's telling his sisters like how to dress and don't go out and don't do this and like cover your hair or don't know these things. So I think uh, we have to teach um, we have to teach young boys how to be how to be men because that, that's what to me like you in order to be a man you have to recognize uh, that you do, that all women and everyone around you have equal rights as you and uh, and that you are also part of this movement uh, for equality. Well, thank you, thank you guys for all your questions, and thank you, Malala, for uh, for joining us. It was really wonderful to hear all your thoughts. Thank you.